morning, everybody. Welcome to the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. My name is Timur. I co-direct the Cyber Policy Initiative here at the Carnegie Endowment. And together with David Brumley, who's the director of the Scilab Security and Privacy Institute at the Carnegie Mellon University, we're delighted to welcome all of you here in person and for those of you joining us on the live stream online. The hashtag for this event is Carnegie Digital. And um, I now have the pleasure of introducing Ambassador Bill Burns to you for the welcoming remarks and look forward to this day with you later today. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome again. Uh, let me begin by congratulating Tim and David uh, and their Carnegie Endowment and Carnegie Mellon colleagues for putting together this extraordinary colloquium. I'm delighted to launch today's event with Subra Suresh, um, whose remarkable leadership of Carnegie Mellon reminds me of how fortunate I am to be a part of the extended Carnegie family. As president of the Carnegie Endowment over nearly the past two years as a, and as a diplomat for 33 years before that, I've had the privilege of welcoming heads of state, military generals, foreign ministers, university presidents, and distinguished thinkers and doers of all stripes. But I've never had the privilege of introducing a robot, let alone several. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Snakebot, Ballbot, and their friends to today's event. Like all of you, I look forward to getting a glimpse of our robotic future later in today's program. Robots are not today's only first. Today is also the first of two events we're holding for the first time with Carnegie Mellon University, one of the world's premier universities and a fellow member of the impressive group of institutions founded by Andrew Carnegie more than a century ago. Andrew Carnegie created these institutions at a critical historical juncture, the foundations of the international order that had prevailed for most of the 19th century were beginning to crack. Catastrophic war and disorder loomed, and the last great surge of the Industrial Revolution was transforming the global economy. The Carnegie Endowment, together with a number of its sister organizations, sought to help establish and reinforce the new system of order that emerged out of the two world wars a system that produced more peace and prosperity in the second half of the 20th century than Andrew Carnegie could ever have imagined. It's hard to escape the feeling that the world is once again at a transformative moment. Profound forces are shaking the underpinnings of international order, the return of great power rivalry and the rise of conflict after many years of decline, the growing use of new information technologies, both as drivers of human advancement and as levers of disruption and division within and among countries. The shift of economic dynamism from west to east and growing pressures of economic dislocation and stagnation and the rejection by societies in many regions of Western-led globalization and the embrace of an angry fortress-like nationalism. Here at the Carnegie Endowment, we're trying to meet these challenges head on across our programs and our six global centers. We focus this colloquium and our partnership with Carnegie Mellon on one of the most significant of these challenges, the intersection of emerging technologies, innovation, and international affairs. Technology's capacity, as all of you know very well, to simultaneously advance and challenge global peace and security is increasingly apparent. In too many areas, the scale and scope of technological innovation is outpacing the development of rules and norms intended to maximize its benefits while minimizing its risks. In today's world, no single country will be able to dictate these rules and norms. As a global institution with deep expertise, decades of experience in nuclear policy, and significant reach into some of the most technologically capable governments and societies, the Carnegie Endowment is well positioned to identify and to help bridge these gaps. Earlier this year, we launched a cyber policy initiative to do just that, working quietly with government officials, experts, and businesses in key countries. Our team is developing norms and measures to manage the cyber threats of greatest strategic significance. These include threats to the integrity of financial data, unresolved tensions between governments and private actors regarding how to actively defend against cyber attack, systemic corruption of the information and communication technology supply chain, 
and attacks on command and control of strategic weapon systems. Our partnership with Carnegie Mellon seeks to deepen the exchange of ideas among our scholars and the global community of technical experts and practitioners wrestling with the whole range of digital governance and security issues. Today's event will focus on artificial intelligence and its implications in the civilian and military domains. Tim and David have curated an exceptional set of panels with diverse international and professional perspectives. On December the 2nd, we will reconvene in Pittsburgh for an equally exciting conversation on internet governance and cybersecurity norms. Our hope is that this conversation will be the beginning of a sustained collaboration between our two institutions and with all of you. There is simply too much at stake for all of us to tackle this problem separately. We can, and indeed we must, tackle it together if we hope to sustain Andrew Carnegie's legacy. I'd like to conclude by thanking Vartan Gregorian and the Carnegie Corporation of New York for making this colloquium possible and for everything they've done and continue to do to contribute to a more peaceful world. And let me now thank and welcome to the stage Subra Suresh, an extraordinary leader of an extraordinary institution and a terrific co-conspirator in this endeavor. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Bill. I, I also want to thank uh, Tim and David for all their efforts. Uh, welcome to the inaugural Carnegie Colloquium, part of an initiative to inform and shape global norms and manners of cooperation in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and cybersecurity. First and foremost, I would like to thank Ambassador Bill Burns for hosting this event today. As two organizations that reflect the strong legacy of Andrew Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace have formed a powerful partnership to examine technology and diplomacy across a set of emerging areas critical to our collective future. It's my sincere hope that this event as well as the follow-up colloquium, which will take place at Carnegie Mellon University on December the 2nd, form the basis of an even broader and closer relationship between our two institutions. Let me also add my thanks to Dr. Vartan Gregorian, president of the Carnegie Corporation of New York, who provided support for both of these events and in fact, uh, is based on a conversation that Ambassador Burns and I had a few months ago. And uh, Dr. Gregorian was very enthusiastic and supportive of this effort. To understand Carnegie Mellon University's importance to artificial intelligence, machine learning, and cybersecurity, we must first recognize CMU as a place where Pioneering work in computer science and artificial intelligence took place decades ago. And ever since Herbert Simon and Alan Newell created the ingredients of artificial intelligence in the 1950s, for the terminology was even uh, recognized broadly, CMU has remained at the cutting edge of this field. Carnegie Mellon took the bold step a generation later, to create its Software Engineering Institute, which has served the nation through the Department of Defense and served industry by acquiring, developing, operating, and sustaining innovative software systems that are affordable, enduring, and trustworthy. Designing safe software systems and attempting to create the learning abilities of the human brain were natural progressions toward two of the modern world's most pressing concerns, cybersecurity and privacy. To meet this challenge, Carnegie Mellon's cybersecurity and privacy research is multidisciplinary and encompassing a broad range of disparate disciplines. 
It incorporates faculty from across the university with strengths in areas such as policy development, risk management, and modeling. Our aim is to build a new generation of technologies that deliver quantifiable computer security and sustainable communication systems and the policy guidelines to maximize their effectiveness. CMU's premier research center on the subject is Scilab, a visionary public-private partnership that has become a world leader in technological research, education, and security awareness among cyber citizens of all ages. By drawing expertise of more than 100 CMU pro professors from various disciplines, Scilab is a world leader in the, in the technical development of artificial intelligence, cyber offense and defense, and is a pipeline for public and private sector leadership in organizations as varied as NSA and Google. The work of Scilab professor Mario Savides, for example, was featured in NOVA program in 60 Minutes report on machine learning and many other aspects. In particular, Professor Savides's facial recognition programming helped match a blurring, a very blurry surveillance photo with the Boston Marathon bomber from a database of one million faces. You will have an opportunity to see Professor Savides's work in action today during the lunchtime demonstrations downstairs. Today, you will also hear from Scilab's director, David Brumley, who led a CMU team just a couple of months ago that won this year's Super Bowl of hacking, DARPA's $2 million cyber grand challenge. Congratulations, David. Just a week later, a week after that, David took a team of CMU students to DEF CON in Las Vegas, where they won again in another hacking competition. Finally, you will hear from Andrew Moore, the dean of our School of Computer Science, who was also recently featured in a 60 Minutes report on artificial intelligence. I would also like to acknowledge Dr. Jim Garrett, the Dean of the College of Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University, who joins us along with Rick Seiger, who played an important role in helping uh, put together this event between Carnegie Mellon and the Carnegie Endowment. TMU's advancements in artificial and cybersecurity will be highlighted in the colloquium today, which is an outgrowth of the partnership between our two organizations. You will learn more about this in the two panel discussions today. We hope that these discussions on the future of consumer privacy and autonomy in military operations will lay a strong foundation for future colloquia and, and they will better inform ongoing thinking in technology and diplomacy in these critical areas. I would like to welcome you to the colloquium today. And I would also like to close by thanking again Ambassador Burns. Thank you. So we will now get started with the first panel discussion. Um, before we start, let me briefly outline the two key ideas that have been driving this event. And when uh, David and I started with the planning for this, the first one was essentially to bring together the technical experts of Carnegie Mellon University and the policy expert from the Carnegie Endowment. That is why each panel is preceded by a setting the stage presentation which one of, with one of the technical experts from Carnegie Mellon University and then will be followed by the panel discussion. The second idea was to draw on Carnegie Endowment's global network to bring in people from around the world for the panel discussion. So I'm particularly pleased to not only welcome our partners from Pittsburgh, um, but also to welcome, um, for example, Yuet, who has come all the way from Hong Kong. Speaking of Pittsburgh, if you're interested to join the event on December 2nd, please make sure to drop your business card out, uh, off outside or send us an email. And I would, I would now like to introduce Andrew Moore, who is the Dean of the School of Computer Science at Car Carnegie Mellon University. And 
the Computer Science School at Carnegie Mellon University has been ranked as the number one school by US News repeatedly in the past few years for the grad school program. And Andrew, prior to becoming dean for the last few years, was vice president of engineering at Google Commerce, has been on the faculty of CMU since 1993, and was named as a fellow for, at the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence um, in 2005. Keeping with the global theme of this event, he originally hails from Bournemouth uh, in the United Kingdom, and it's a pleasure to have you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Tim. So this is a uh, really interesting and exciting time in the world of artificial intelligence uh, for many people, for regular consumers, it's got great promise for them. For companies, it is an absolutely critical differentiator and for societies in general, we do have options here to make the world a much better place through careful application of technology. What I'd like to do to set the stage here is talk about two things which are, which at first sight sound like clear goods. Personalization, I'll explain what that means, and privacy, two extremely important issues. Then I'm gonna run through a series of cases where these two great principles start to bump into each other. And they will get increasingly sophisticated. And by the end of this stage setting, I hope to have everyone kind of squirming in their seats because it's so annoying that two wonderful and important things, privacy and personalization, which seem like clear goods, uh, lead us to very difficult societal and technical challenges. So that's what I'm gonna to try to do in the next couple of minutes. <laughs> All right. So let's begin with uh, privacy. It's a clear right, and we would almost all of us agree that anyone who intentionally violates privacy by revealing information which they gained in confidence uh, is doing something bad. And there's laws uh, in our international legal system and in all our domestic legal systems which deal with that issue. So that's important. Personalization. Personalization is probably one of the most critical features of a world based on artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I'll explain some places where it's obviously good. Uh, many, many great institutions, including Carnegie Mellon under Dr. Suresh's uh, leadership, are pushing very hard to understand how we can help children learn more effectively. If it turns out that I, as a child, have problems with uh, understanding when to use the letters CK while I'm writing. It makes a lot of sense for an automated tutor to personalize their instruction to me so that they can really practice that particular issue with me. No doubt about it. That seems like a sensible thing. If I'm a patient uh, in a hospital and it becomes pretty clear that unlike most patients, I cannot tolerate uh, more than a certain amount of uh, uh, ibuprofen uh, within uh, 20 minutes of a meal, uh, as we learn that, of course, it makes sense to personalize my treatment. So that is good. And at the moment, there's no difficulty involved. Here's where it gets interesting. Some aspects of personalization, like, for instance, uh, how I'm likely to react to some liver cancer uh, medications. It's not like we can personalize it by just looking at what's happened to me over my lifetime, because probably this is the very first time I've ever had those medications. When you're an artificial intelligence engineer building a personalization system, the way you power it is to find out about me and then ask the question, so to make things good for Andrew, what should I do and what can I learn from other people like Andrew? And that's suddenly where you begin to see this big conflict. Other people like Andrew uh, is something which can help me a lot because if it turns out that uh, uh, everyone who's uh, over six foot three with a British accent uh, is virulently uh, opposed to, for example, the Electric Light Orchestra, uh, it's an extremely useful thing to know so that I can make sure that's never uh, uh, recommended to me. So. It makes sense to use other people's information in aggregate to help personalize things for me. And in many examples, that can really make things better. Recommendations of movies is an obvious one. 
And then when you start to think of information on the web, uh, for example, if I like to browse news uh, every day, and we notice that I'm typical of people who perhaps in the mornings are very interested in policy-related news, but in the evenings when I'm relaxing, I tend to like uh, uh, technology-related news, then that's useful information to help make sure that I'm a happier person when I'm reading the news. So this is the upside of personalization. Personalization uses machine learning. Machine learning is exactly the technology which looks at data, figures out the patterns to usefully say what would other people like Andrew want and what the definition is, what it is for someone to be alike with me or dissimilar from me. It's the thing which powers ads in Gmail, it's the thing which powers movie recommendations, uh, and it's the thing which uh, helps uh, the personalized medicine initiative figure out how to treat you who probably need different treatment from someone else. And now I'm going to go through four examples of increasing squirminess of why this stuff is hard, why privacy and personalization uh, actually start to conflict with each other. The first case is one where I don't think we actually do have any trouble with policy. It's a simple case of what we'd like to think that society is going to do. If someone publishes unauthorized data about me, they are breaking the law and uh, uh, there should, that should be remedied. That is the simplest case. And the responsibility there in a good company or a well-functioning government is you actually have the legislation in place, you have clear rules, and uh, if somebody does, for example, look up uh, the bank account of a famous celebrity just so they can blog about it, uh, that person's going to get fired. And in some cases, if the consequences are serious, there's, there's a more significant penalty. Now, cases two, three, and four are ones where it starts to get a little fuzzier. Case two, someone uses your data in a way that you didn't expect, but it turns out you kind of agreed to it. Uh, and a famous example is uh, a firefighter in Everett, Washington, uh, who uh, was suspected of actually starting fires. And one of the ways in which the police really got uh, to understand that this was a serious risk was they then went to their grocery coupon supplier and looked at the things that this particular person had purchased in the last couple of months, and they found a huge number of fire starting kits from that. In another case, uh, someone who was suing a supermarket for a slip and fall accident, part of the supermarket's defense was they produced sales records for that person showing that they had, uh, what they were buying excessive, in their eyes, amounts of alcohol. Now those are not actually illegal. Both of those were covered under the terms of services and all terms of service and also the laws of the land regarding law enforcement use of data. But that's difficult. At that point, we've already hit something where the general public is going to be very uncomfortable and it's the thing which means that we all feel uneasy when we sign these terms and services. Those are difficult ones, but now I'm going to get to the ninja difficult ones, which are just beginning to emerge and make things very interesting for artificial intelligence engineers who are trying to do good, but can quite easily accidentally do bad. So this next example is where we're using machine learning to really help people, but inadvertently, accidentally, the machine learning system starts to look like a bigot or make decisions which most of us would think a reasonable human would not make. And uh, a good example of this is uh, from a member of Jim Garrett's faculty, the School of Engineering at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, Anupam Data, who showed a little experiment with Google's advertising system where we look, he looked at uh, the ads which were shown in response to a query uh, about job searches. And he used Google's personalization system to give exactly the same queries to Google when the uh, revealed identity of the user was male and when they were female. And horribly, it turned out that the ads shown when the person was revealed to be female were for jobs with lower pay, which 
you look at that and anyone would think if that machine learning algorithm was a person, they are both a jerk and in fact they are doing something illegal. Just this morning, uh, an example with Facebook who are introducing a, uh, an ethnic affiliation term in their advertising system has fallen afoul of a very similar issue. Now why would a machine learning system do this? None of the engineers were, uh, at least I'm going to very, very much assume that none of the engineers had any intent of causing harm. The reason was the machine learning system had just observed in the data prior to this that all else being equal, which is a very difficult, dangerous uh, phrase to use, uh, it was seeing that the women who were clicking on ads tended to click on ads for lower paying jobs than the men. So this machine learning algorithm, which we humans built, has got a kind of defense. It can really say, I am just showing people what they're most likely to click on. It's not my fault if society is set up in such a way that uh, uh, my data is showing that women are clicking on lower paid ads. Now, this is complicated and I don't have the right answer for you. Uh, if it helps, I should notice that this experiment is particularly unrealistic in the sense that it's very rare that uh, a machine learning system only sees an identified gender. Usually the machine learning system sees many other things about a person. They actually have the past history of the kind of thing that that person wants to do, uh, other interests about that person, and so it will actually you find that there are other features of that person much more important than gender or race for showing their particular interests. It still makes us feel uncomfortable. So that is what I would regard as the most difficult part of uh, machine learning and personalization at the moment. It is very hard, and I do not know of a, uh, a piece of research that I fully trust to prevent these things from being, uh, if you like, bigots. Finally, I'm going to mention the ninja hard case. And this is pretty simple. Uh, it is the case that if you really want to preserve privacy, you can cost other people their lives. Uh, there are examples of this in many law enforcement situations, but uh, another simple one is in medicine, where if you're involved in a drug trial, and suppose you had 20 hospitals all trying out some new drug treatment on 20 different patients, then it is definitely in the interests of those patients for the hospitals to pool their data, to actually share data with each other so that one central body can do the machine learning with a large N for statistical significance to find out if uh, the system is working or not. Now, if you decide not to do that, that you're so worried about privacy that you're going to not let the hospitals reveal details about the patients to each other, then you can still actually get some statistically significant results as to whether the medication is effective or not. It's just going to take you considerably longer and many more patients will have to be in the trial and you'll have to wait longer before you get the answers. And Matt Fredrickson, a computer science faculty member at Carnegie Mellon, has shown some very clear cases of uh, the actual analysis of privacy levels versus lives saved or years of life saved. And unfortunately, and it's exactly what this room doesn't want to hear, it's a trade-off. There's a trade-off curve there. It's almost certain in my mind that we don't want to be on either extreme end of that trade-off curve, but we do have to decide where we are uh, within, within the center of it. So hopefully we're squirming. I've tried to show you that uh, no extreme position on personalization is good, screw privacy, or privacy is good, screw personalization. Neither of those extreme uh, positions uh, are useful. We have to use our technological smarts and our policy smarts to try to find the right place in the middle. And that's the setup for this panel discussion. Thank you. At this point, uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our panelists. Uh, Yuet Tham from uh, the law firm of Sydney Austin, who is a uh, uh, an expert on cross-border compliance and 
uh, international agreements regarding data use. Uh, if you want to come up to the uh, chair. Uh, Paul Timmers, uh, the director of the Sustainable and Secure Society Directorate at the European Community, uh, has been uh, uh, head of the ICT uh, Organization for Inclusion and E-Government Units. Uh, so we have uh, experts here uh, from Asia and from Europe who are helping us uh, discuss this issue. And next, I'm pleased to uh, introduce uh, uh, Ed Felton, uh, a hero to all computer scientists, because he's a computer scientist and the deputy, C the, the deputy director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, who has been leading a bunch of uh, intense strategic thinking about artificial intelligence over the next few years. And then uh, I would like to introduce our moderator, Ben Scott, the senior advisor from New America, who is the senior advisor to the Open Technology Institute, uh, and also a non-residential fellow at the Center for Internet and Society at Stanford. Good to meet you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for that introduction. Uh, we're going to jump right into a discussion with uh, our expert panelists who, uh, as you see, strategically represent different regions of the world and so can offer perspectives on these questions uh, from across the globe. If I may quickly summarize the policy conundrum that sits beneath the, the cases that Andrew laid out, it is this. Machine learning and AI benefits from the personalization of data using machine learning algorithms. Personalization requires large data sets. To compare individual cases to lots of other cases, it requires the collection and processing of data at a large scale. That raises two key questions. One is, what are the rules governing the collection and processing of data for commercial uses of AI? And raises key issues for, what are the rules for collection and processing of data for government use of AI? Underneath that sits the basic question of algorithmic accountability. If you decide that it is unacceptable to have an algorithm that reflects gender bias in employment practices, how do you regulate that? And if you decide you regulate that at the national level, how do you coordinate that at the international level when data markets are global? These are the problems that we are all facing in government. And I think it's fair to say that the technological reach of machine learning and artificial intelligence has exceeded the grasp of our policy frameworks to contain and shape these new forms of digital power in the public interest. So what I'd like to do is start with um, setting a baseline of where different parts of the world are coming down on these issues and you know, what the building blocks look like um, at, at the regional level. There have been lots of efforts in, in the US to address these questions. There have been lots of, of debates in the, in the European Union to address these questions. I would say less so in Asia, although I'll be interested to hear more uh, from Hewitt about what's happening uh, in, in Asian markets. But I, I want to first begin by allowing all of our panelists to speak from their own perspectives about what's happening in, in, their, um, in this field, in their region. What is the, what is the approach to regulating or uh, establishing a policy framework for these most difficult questions of big data collection and the application of, of artificial intelligence? So maybe I'll, I'll begin with you, Ed. Okay, well, uh, I... First, first, I should start by with the disclaimer that I am not a lawyer, and so do not treat me as an authority on US law on this issue. But I can talk about the policy approach that uh, has been taken in the United States. And it, it uh, is rooted out of the uh, longer term policy approach that the US has taken with respect to privacy. Um, and that involves generally uh, uh, regulation of certain sectors where, uh, where privacy is particularly salient, um, whether it involves things like healthcare or, um, uh, or practices related to credit and employment and so on. Um, and, and it also involves a broader consumer protection framework uh, around privacy that is uh, rooted in notions of notice and consent. Um, and so we have a, a framework for, for privacy which, uh, which the US has used and is continuing to use, and that involves both laws and it involves also uh, enforcement of those laws. When it comes to the particular issues that are raised by 
AI and machine learning. Um, there are a bunch of things that, uh, that ha have been done. Um, and I point to, in particular, over the last few years at the work that the administration has done on big data and then more recently on artificial intelligence. Um, on both of those areas, and I think they're tightly intertwined, uh, the administration has uh, engaged in a series of public outreach uh, activities and then uh, published reports. The idea being to try to drive a public conversation about these policy challenges and to, uh, and to try to move, both to move the, the debate about making rules and making policy in a fundamentally positive way, but also to heighten the uh, attention to and interest in these issues and to try to drive a, a public debate. Uh, because I believe strongly that um, the institutions, the companies that are collecting data and using it in this way, um, almost universally want to use it, collect it, and, uh, and engage in AI activities in, in a way that is responsible and positive and sustainable. Because I think people recognize that um, if you push the envelope too much, that the public will not allow that to stand. Uh, and so. We've really tried to drive a public discussion. We've tried to raise the level of dialogue. And um, that's been fundamentally uh, one of the areas in which uh, the administration has worked. We also recognize the importance of, we also recognize the ways in which these issues uh, operate across borders and the, need to, uh, and the need to work with international partners and to make sure that, um, that as data flows across borders and as uh, citizens everywhere encounter the the companies, the institutions of other nations that, um, that uh, we can work together reasonably and we have an international system for dealing with these things. Thanks, Ed. Paul, what's the view from Brussels? <laughs> the view from Brussels. Um, perhaps I should put in um, uh, another kind of uh, disclaimer in a certain sense. That is, I think if you look at what is happening in policy development, whether that is uh, engagement with stakeholders, public debates like uh, here, or whether you go in the direction of uh, official public policy or law and regulation, you have to put it actually uh, against the reality of what is happening uh, around technology and around the use of technology. So I think the examples that Andrew gave are, are really interesting and uh, challenging. You fourth example, the, the case where, for example, um, you don't, machine learning doesn't have access to your personal data, even if it would be good for other people. Well, um, it's a very interesting case because you have to look at it. How could you apply today's frameworks, including law to that? So to a degree, uh, law is pretty strong in the European Union based upon fundamental rights. And we would look at um, fundamental rights, but also over fundamental rights are not absolute. So uh, the public health is one of those reasons that you can actually start using someone's personal data, also individual data, but with uh, appropriate safeguards. And that may mean that you put a challenge to, te to technology. Can you anonymize, pseudonymize? Can you encrypt sufficiently? Can you use new technologies like blockchain so that you have accountability after the fact, after it has been used? So um, it is, I think, that dialogue that we are also very much looking for in the European scene. It must be said, Fundamental rights are very, very important in the European setting. So if we say privacy, privacy is a fundamental right. As a matter of fact, we even split it into privacy from the uh, perspective of the protection of your uh, private life and the protection of your, your communication versus personal data. So there are differences. There's more than one fundamental right that is at play there. Um, based upon that, we have law, but we have also policy development. And it's a very actively moving field. For example, at the moment, we are working on a policy initiative around the free flow of data and, and, and around platforms. And precisely those are being put to the test by machine learning, AI, uh, precisely by the questions that we have here on the table. Ewan, how's it look in Asia? Um, OK, so I'm, I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, I, I'm a lawyer. <coughs> so I'm going to approach this from, from a re regulatory perspective. And I think one of the challenges about Asia is that you know, it, it's not even bifurcated, just in terms of you know, the laws and the regulations that are coming out of the region. I mean, in fact, when we talk about Asia, I mean, what do we really mean? You know, different people have got different views about Asia as well. Um, but I think you know, when, when you talk about um, privacy laws in, in um, Asia Pacific, I think the countries that come to mind as being you know, at, the, at the forefront 
um, of, of regulations would be Japan and Korea, um, and then to some extent, um, Australia and New Zealand. Um, and then you know, following that would be countries such as um, um, Singapore and Hong Kong, Taiwan and the Philippines, where they've got um, fairly new laws. I mean, some of them were actually put into place you know, in, in 2012. I mean, Singapore is a country where I, mean, I used to be from the Attorney General's chambers. And, you know, it's the in, in terms of the laws, I mean, they are progressive. But the fact is that they implemented the privacy laws for the first time in 2012. So that again gives you some idea as to you know the the importance that they place on privacy. Um, and then in the last category, you've got countries such as Indonesia, um, Vietnam, and China. And so these are the countries where we call them privacy laws, but they're not really based on privacy, not individual privacy anyway. And you know, I, I heard today a lot about human rights, how privacy is a human right. Um, and you know, for a lot of these countries, I mean, these laws emanate not because of a motivation to protect human rights, but although I mean, a lot of it would be consumer rights, I, and then I think some people would argue that you know, consumer rights would be to some extent human rights as well. Um, and a lot of these laws that come into place, I mean, uh, the last category of countries, I mean, what is challenging about them is that they don't have you know a single data privacy regulation, and I tell my clients, I mean, a little facetiously, but it's true to some extent. Sometimes, you know, the more laws a country has, I mean, I, I do a lot of, you know, FCPA um, corruption investigations, for example, and, and in the course of that, you know, we take a lot of emails um, throughout the region, which is why we need familiarity with data privacy rules and regulations. And I always joke with some of my clients that, you know, don't look at the transparency index to see how risky a country is when it comes to corruption look at how many laws they have. The more anti-corruption laws they have, the more problematic corruption tends to be in that country. And it is the same for you know, countries such as China and Vietnam and Indonesia. You find little bits and pieces of information. You know, they refer to you know, how privacy is um, you know, it's a, a right of all uh, citizens, but they don't really tell you how that's gonna be enforced. I mean, that is a regulation that you see in China. And so I think some of the, the the challenges in, in Asia is just trying to harmonize the regulations for a lot of companies, a lot of our clients that are trying to operate and transfer data across borders. Um, and you know, you, you have a lot of, so Japan, for example, has got um, a new law that's gonna come into force in about two years. And that's probably the first time where they actually talk about data anonymization. Um, in terms of all the other countries, I think the, the, the idea of artificial intelligence is, is not even something that you know, the countries have, have seriously considered. Um, there are things that you might see guidelines in, you know, introduced by some of the regulators, but again, these are just guidelines and they, there is no teeth to any of them. Let me uh, pick out a point which I think is implicit in what you said, which is we, we've, you've all described the approach of uh, United States, Europe, a variety of Asian countries to these questions from a commercial data privacy perspective. We're regulating the market, commercial actors gathering data, applying artificial intelligence algorithms to produce particular outcomes. But I think at the core of this question from a regulatory and especially from a political perspective is when you collect a lot of data and you begin to produce these outcomes, that is of interest to government. And government access to data is inextricably intertwined with the commercial data protection regulations. The recent tensions between the United States and Europe over the operation of American technology companies in Europe has to some extent been about commercial data practices, but ultimately it is rooted in gov US government access to the commercial data that is collected by American companies. So my question is, do you believe that even if we were able to find a harmonization, a standard for commercial data regulations that apply to big data collection and the application of artificial intelligence algorithms, machine learning, is it all undermined at the end of the day by individual countries' national security interests and their unwillingness to give up any kind of access to that data from a government uh, uh, for national security or law enforcement purposes? I can actually just give a very quick example before, before we go to Europe and, and the US. I mean. China has got a provision where 
you know, it, it's one of the few examples of data localization. So if any information that relates to health, the medical information or health of the citizens has to be stored in servers in China. Um, and another example is, is the Singapore data privacy provisions. I mean, they don't, the, the, the Singapore government and all state entities are excluded from its provision. So that's a very good example of you know, where the state's rights come first. Uh, perhaps uh, building on that, I, th I think this, this whole question about uh, national security and sovereignty, perhaps you also have to generalize a little bit and there are other interests too that are uh, certainly governmental interest or uh, should be interested for society at, uh, um, at scale, uh, which is uh, safeguarding democracy. So I think one of the concerns, if, if you look at um, Merkel last week gave a speech at the Median Tag and talked about uh, the transparency of algorithms of large platforms. And this is in order to keep consumers properly informed, but it's also uh, what is the kind of bias that may creep in through the algorithms in terms of the provision of news. And that's got everything to do with the way you uh, execute democracy. So there's an underlying debate about avoiding that we get into a situation where um, democracy gets uh, polarized into uh, echo chambers and we don't have a real debate anymore. And that's, a, that's also a serious interest, I think, uh, where you're talking about essentially norms and values, to what extent are they shared internationally? Now, I think we can be optimistic and pessimistic about that. So if we talk about uh, data protection, we have, after all, been able to make an agreement between Europe and the United States, even if we do not have exactly the same starting point as regards uh, data protection, let alone as regards uh, national security. The privacy shield, I know it's going to be put to the test and that's how it should be, uh, but nevertheless we got a lot further than what we had at the time in Safe Harbor because we actually started to describe that area of access by government for national security purposes to, to those data that are being transferred in a transatlantic context and the safeguards for that. So it is possible if you negotiate to make an agreement on certain types of issues, whether you can do that for everything and uh, across the world, I think is very doubtful. There are many places where norms and values don't work. So if we bring it to the field of cybersecurity, that's where we clearly see it. We do negotiate internationally about norms and values uh, in relationship to cybersecurity, which has got everything to do with AI also. Uh, are we getting very far? Well, only petit à petit and little steps. So it's, um, I think, it's it's not a single type of answer to this question. There is a degree of progress between, let's say, those that have a degree of like-mindedness, uh, but there's also uh, many many areas where we can where we should be rather uh, reserved or perhaps even pessimistic. I think there are um, there are plenty of areas uh, in which uh, government access to data for purposes of national security or law enforcement is. Uh, relatively uncontroversial, and I think we don't want to forget those. Um, there, and of course, the uh, international discussions around this issue have been going on longer than the uh, than than the conversation about AI. Um, these are not these issues are not simple. But I, I think uh, if you look at Privacy Shield, for example, it is an example of the way in which it it is possible for us to engage internationally and to get to a point where we can work together. Uh, as to these issues about, uh, about fairness or non-discrimination, I think this is another area in which there is a broad alignment of interests internationally and in which uh, I think there's a lot of progress we can make by working together. Let me, um, let me present a more pessimistic vision and ask your responses to this, which is, it, to me it stands to reason that as the private sector grows more sophisticated with machine learning technologies, collects more data, applies more powerful AI algorithms to that data. Uh, it will be irresistible for government to reach into those companies for legitimate reasons in many cases, but also perhaps for illegitimate ones, to gain access to that power. The example that you raised of the firefighter buying um, uh, Arson, arson kits. I don't know where you buy those or where, where you have coupons <laughs> for them. But uh, the, the idea that law enforcement may not only tap your phone calls or your emails, but should also look at your purchasing records or know your health data and put together a portrait for you and compare you against others and calculate the probability that you may have committed a crime 
is an extraordinary development and one which I think governments in many legitimate cases would want to use. But what that says to me is that ultimately every country is going to want to control that data for, their, for themselves in their own sovereign territory. So my question is, number one, are we headed for a, a, a global data sovereignty movement where everyone tries to have data localization rules, where the power of AI operated by domestic companies is, 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 tr is, uh, is used as a, as a geopolitical asset. And second, if the countermeasure is algorithmic transparency, which I took to be Chancellor Merkel's uh, concept, to what extent does that get you an outcome? Is that an effective solution? If Facebook turned around and said, okay, we'll show you how our algorithm works for news feeds, does that solve the problem? Yes, it, it reflects the actual user, the, 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 the behaviors of users and reflects back to them the things that they are most likely to click on. At, do, do, you then, do you then regulate that algorithm and tell Facebook you have to change that algorithm? And then how do you, how do you hold them accountable? How do you determine whether they have done so in a way that, is, that measures up to a particular standard? So I guess two questions. One is, are we headed towards a hard power regime of data localization, in your view, at the global level? And two is, even if we are able to use transparency as a tool to push back against excesses of AI, does it even work? Let me, let me start by taking the second part of that, um, about the, uh, the value of transparency. Uh, which I think really goes to a desire for uh, governance and accountability. Uh, and one way to try to get there to increase accountability would be to say, well, open up everything, tell us everything about what your algorithm is, tell us everything about what your data is. Um, but here I think is a place where we can apply better technical approaches to, uh, to try to provide accountability, to try to provide evidence of fairness or non-discrimination or certain accountability along certain dimensions without unnecessarily needing to reveal everything. Um, I think there, one of the traps we can fall into in thinking about this issue um, is to think that this is a problem caused by technology which can be addressed only by laws and regulations. But I think it's important to recognize, um, as I think the discussion today has, that um, that technology can be an important part of addressing these problems, that there are technologies of accountability um, and that we need to think in a creative way about how to put those things together. We also need to think, I think, about the ways in which um, forces short of um, legal prohibition can constrain the behavior of companies and authorities when it comes to the use of data uh, to the extent that what is happening is, um, uh, is known to the public to the extent that there is an opportunity to provide evidence of fairness, evidence of, uh, of accountability. Um, that in itself creates a dynamic in which um, companies and authorities uh, may, uh, uh, will often voluntarily provide that kind of accountability. We've seen that to some extent in privacy where companies would like to be able to make strong promises to consumers for consumer comfort but knowing that they will be held to those uh, promises, you get a dynamic in which, um, in which companies can compete based on privacy. To the same extent, uh, if we have technologies and mechanisms of soft accountability, that that can lead to, uh, that can lead number one, to a, a competition to uh, provide a service in a way that's more friendly in order to bring people in. Um, and it can also lead to the kind of accountability that occurs when some bad behavior is revealed. So I think there's a lot more opportunities there to use softer forms of governance and to use technology to try to work on that issue of, uh, around fairness and governance. Paul, do you think the uh, general data protection regulation is a sufficiently flexible instrument for softer forms of Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, I think what Ed says, uh, I find that really challenging because I think indeed uh, technology needs to be uh, invited to make things work really well like the underlying uh, intentions like with the general data protection and regulation. So if you talk about informed consent, even informed consent about automated uh, processing, that's a real challenge for technology. And then you can bounce back and say it's impossible because uh, these algorithms, we don't even know ourselves what's happening inside, but that's not adequate. That's not sufficient as an answer. 
perhaps there are still other approaches, and I think uh, you are referring that there are other approaches where you can measure uh, things like uh, fairness, uh, things like uh, did you actually understand what is happening with the decision making? And also, I must say, um, going a little bit away from the monolithic assumption that, for example, consent is a one-off notion. No, there is an interaction that you can continue to have, and that's what the technology can mediate when you're talking about consent as the use of the data evolves. So I'm kind of optimistic about uh, the reach that uh, the, the opportunities that are there in technology. When you talk about localization, um, again, probably a, a nuanced uh, approach to that um, is necessary because there is a real risk. I think you point to that, that data localization happens. Uh, you, it's happening already today and actually that we do not necessarily get an internet by country, but perhaps an internet by region. So kind of a balkanization of, uh, of the internet. Um, at the same time, we have initiatives going on, and I referred earlier to the privacy shield. You know, that's a way to, to uh, avoid data localization. And then we are talking about personal data. Uh, we have a free flow of data initiative going on to actually uh, remove any undue restriction to the, uh, to, uh, the lo localization of data. Um, and uh, I think we, we probably want to differentiate which domains are we talking about. When we talk about um, a public health problem, like uh, the rise of uh, the threat of the Zika virus, virus, I think we have a non-localized approach to that. We have governance systems like WHO's and uh, the professional collaboration in the field of health that allows us to do big data, AI type of analysis on uh, the data we are getting from uh, Zika all over the world, as a matter of fact. So for me, that's a pointer to it, that in this debate, we need to involve the governance that already exists almost any kind of governance institution that we have uh, in the world that works will be exposed to the question of uh, what do you do with data and AI? And why not make use of those institutions too? So that may be uh, in a more differentiated way. It will not work in every domain, but there are certainly domains where it will work. Will it work, for example, from the, for the data that we have coming from self-driving cars? I'm not sure. Yeah, we did not yet develop a regime. So perhaps a necessarily complex but therefore differentiated sector by sector approach could be and moreover forward. i think you learn from what you do in one sector for others so that's not necessarily showing that it is uh, impossible to come up with governance must be said that there's a strong plea i think in europe uh, also to come up with new governance uh, approaches and also to say not all governance approaches will work so the real-time uh, threat of uh, of uh, cyber incidents uh, may not be quite compatible with the type of governance that we have set up between people and organizations, which is relatively slow. Uh, and and uh, so we will also have to review the type of governance that we already have. And I think for, for Asia, I know, I know this sounds a little self-serving, but I think we still need regulations. I mean, because so many of the countries still don't have something that would be taken for granted in, in the rest of the world. Um, and so, you know, for those jurisdictions that have the laws in place, uh, I think the question is, you know, how is the enforcement and, you know, the policy, policy positions uh, going to be made in terms of the guidelines that are issued by the regulators? But there are so many other countries in Asia that still don't even have, you know, very basic privacy laws. Um, I, I think at the end of the day, you still need those to be in place, I mean, for the framework at the very least, um, which is, and, and, and a lot of Asia follows the notice and consent um, uh, principle that is, you know, adopted um, in, in the rest of the world. Um, I think in, in, in terms of data localization, I mean, a lot of it is usually done for various reasons, and they're usually not because of privacy. Uh, for example, Indonesia, I mean, they talked about localizing data, and, but the reason for that was because, you know, they, they thought that this was under this misguided uh, belief that, you know, that was going to help improve their economy by localizing data. Um, but what the government didn't realize was that that was going to put off a lot of the multinational corporations from, from investing in the country, and so they held back from that. Um, which brings me to my, my you know, last point in terms of, I, I think you know, what we have seen is that with all the you know, international or multinational companies that have set up operations in, in Asia, they, they bring along with them uh, regulations that they have to follow because, you know, for example, they are dealing with data from the European um, Union or the US. And because of that, they tend to follow you know, the, the, the standard that's set the highest. 
And so when you have consumers in, in Asia who see, hey, you know, this is the way, you know, my data should be treated. And, and this is, you know, the, um, the, the way an international corporation would deal with my data and my, my privacy. Um, then, you know, they start expecting that from the other institutions within the country. And so I think there has been a lot of that where, you know, the, the cascading of, of, of privacy, even though the regulations aren't in place, but you, you've got that economic pressure to, to a large extent. So I want to put one more provocation to the panel, but before I do that, I want to invite you all to start thinking about questions that you may have for the panelists. We're going to reserve the last section of this panel for audience questions, so start uh, thinking about that while I put this question to the panel, which is about all three of you have now raised notice and consent. It is the basis of privacy law across the world at the moment, and yet even before AI was already under fire, already under attack about whether it would ever be sufficient for various reasons. Uh, there is an argument that notice and consent is a sham because you know, you're, you're presenting a consumer with a 15-page document in nine-point type for a service that they want to buy, and no one ever reads it. They have no idea what they've consented to, even though they've been noticed. And once you click that box and hit I agree, all of the rights that you had up to that point are gone. Not all, but many. Second, as we collect more and more data and companies become diversified horizontally across multiple product platforms, it may not know exactly what it is that they're going to do with your data. And they may not know to give you notice at that point. And at what point do you build in multiple notification points? I, I've uh, recently had occasion to talk to a number of uh, founders of new Silicon Valley startups, uh, not just in Silicon Valley, I should say, but also in Europe, where I spent the last several years in Berlin. And data is the new value property. People are building companies based purely on the idea that they're collecting lots and lots of data. What they will do with that data, how they will monetize it, how they will pool that resource with other resources, how they will be acquired and integrated into the data properties of another larger enterprise, big question mark, but undeniably not a deterrent for venture capital flowing into those companies. Once again, draws into, the question, draws into question this basic notion of notice and consent. If we come into a world where data is pooled intentionally in a fashion to maximize the utility of personalization, it might not even be reasonable to ask a company to predict in advance all of the ways in which that data may be used. And they may not be the only ones who gain access to that data and use it for purposes that may benefit or harm the user. So my question to the panel is, if we root the idea of a, an international standard on privacy policy as it applies to big data and algorithmic accountability on an old framework of notice and consent, are we setting ourselves up for failure from the beginning? Okay. By all means. So um, I think uh, notice and consent is not that at all. Uh, uh, what we are challenged to do is to make sure that consent is uh, informed, meaningful, freely given, uh, that there is a choice, uh, and that's simply not often not implemented. The 40-page contract is not meaningful. So how do you translate that into something which is uh, meaningful? Uh, besides, it must be said that uh, in order to process your personal data, it's not only consent that may be a uh, ground, a lawful ground, but uh, as the General Data Protection Regulation said, at least in Europe, there are also other legitimate grounds. For example, uh, public health is one of those, and certainly uh, issues around uh, public safety, uh, security, etc. may be grounds to process personal data without consent. So there is actually even the legitimate interest for direct marketing purposes uh, may constitute, as the law says, may constitute a legitimate uh, ground to process personal data. Now, the question is, how do you interact? Because in all those cases, you still will have to interact with uh, the data subject, the one that is providing the data. So how do you do that in a meaningful way? And I must say, I'm still a bit puzzled why interaction with the user is a problem. From a company point of view, you would often probably say, I rather interact more with the user than less. Because each point that I interact is another opportunity 
to engage in uh, the discovery of value and the delivery of value to differentiate. If I may ask a follow-up, what if the user is dead? We're soon into a moment in our history where there are, is terabytes of data out there about people who are no longer living. And yet that, that data will undoubtedly have value to the companies that own it and to the governments that may gain access to that data. How do you deal with that? How do yeah, so you, you, uh, you will probably be thinking of a case where you would like to uh, invoke a public interest, for example, public health. And again, uh, certainly the European law says that if it is about such public interest, you can actually use uh, that as another legitimate ground to start processing data. So there are possibilities, but the, the really big technical difficulties, I think, or actually the underlying difficulties that have to do with um, uh, algorithmic uh, accountability, which is not uh, resolved, or actually we have a broad debate with the health community in Europe. The radiologists are saying, what do I do with all those data that I have that I now start to uh, put again under data protection, and how do I make sure that, for example, the right to be forgotten can be applied to that. So there are really serious, I think, implementation challenges, and they will not always have the most uh, ideal answer. But in a certain sense, we are looking them back into a legacy, uh, and a legacy that we can improve as the interpretation of the law evolves. So all of the communities that are uh, involved in personal data in uh, Europe, for sure, are also really called upon to uh, look at uh, what the technology and the law makes possible and uh, provide their interpretation of that, a, a common interpretation rather than a fragmented one. And that's clearly a challenge that still needs to happen, for, happen from public administration to radiologists. Then in answer to your second question actually about, I mean, there are a number of laws in Asia where, you know, if the person, the subject is dead, the concept of privacy doesn't apply anymore and the law doesn't protect that data. Um, open season on that data. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. Um, and I, I think, you know, just in terms of the, um, the other question that you raised about, you know, notice and consent. Um, so I, I say this a little facetiously again, but, you know, we used to joke, we can draft, you know, these, pr these consent agreements and, and put in as much as we like, and no one is gonna disagree. Everybody will just click agree. Um, and I, I read this book, you know, called Future Crimes. I have to say, after reading that book, I, I refuse to load apps on my iPhone to the extent that I can. Um, it is very difficult to live without apps, but, you know, I, I probably have one of the fewest apps in the whole of Asia um, on my phone after reading that, that book. But I, I remember some of the statistics that I saw in that book about how I think the privacy policy for Facebook is double the length of the U.S. Constitution. And, you know, I, I think it was either PayPal or eBay, I can't remember which company, where the privacy policy is longer than Hamlet. And, and I've, I've, I've given, you know, presentations, a lot of presentations in, in Asia about privacy and data security. And I've always asked this question, you know, how many times have you actually said, I don't agree, you know, when, when that the privacy policy pops up? And, you know, in all the presentations I've given, only one person said, you know, like put up the hand, and, and that was a lecturer from from one of the universities in, um, you know, it's just like an academic, isn't it, to some extent. Um, <laughs> but um, I think, you know, most people don't, they'll just click yes, because they don't have much of a choice. It's not because they don't think it's important, and it's not because people in Asia don't value privacy, but I think the difficulty is that, you know, there aren't many avenues for them to seek redress, and, you know, because you don't have the concept of class litigation, um, and it's not a litigious society in general in Asia, it's, it's very difficult for individuals or consumers to, to get together and, and, you know, to change the laws and the policies. So this is a fundamentally difficult issue, right? The uses to which some data may be put may be extremely complex, and the implications of those uses for a particular user may be even more complex. So if we were to start with the principle that something should not be collected if its use will not, would not have been acceptable to the user. Uh, it's not at all clear how you could put that into effect in practice, right? We know that telling users every last detail of what will happen and every last detail of the implication, asking them to read that before they disclose anything ever um, is not practical and that's not the way people behave. 
Now, now that said, there are a few strange people like um, academics and privacy lawyers who do read these things. Um, and there are people who have built tools that look for changes and so on and analyze them. So if a company does change, it's very long, longer than Hamlet, but not as interesting privacy policy um, in a way that is relevant. There is some chance that, reasonable chance that will be noticed and it will trigger some public debate off of that. So I think that there are methods of accountability other than all the users reading all the things, which we know doesn't happen. Um, but still, it's a fundamentally difficult question. And if we were to offload that decision to someone else, uh, we, don't make it, um, we don't make it terribly much easier to figure out what the right answer is as to which uses would be acceptable to the user or which uses are socially beneficial. Maybe the, the issue is, you know, it's got to be meaningful notice and meaningful consent. And I think one of the things that I've, you know, just, just from a policy perspective, I mean, that because the, the notion of, you know, these notice, these uh, consent agreements is that they, they shift everything onto the individual consumer who doesn't really have the ability to, to you know, reject the terms. Um, and so I think, you know, just in terms of the policy, you know, when it comes to AI and, you know, all the other provisions. I, I think, you know, it's important for the governments to actually think about shifting a lot of their responsibility back to the corporations um, for, you know, self-assessment and, and things like that. But so. I'm, I'm wondering if you also cannot kind of start splitting it up because we, in, in the sense that, uh, especially if it is about automated processing, you have to explain uh, the significance and the envisaged consequences for the user. And the point I think that we're making is, First of all, it's very difficult for a user to understand and read all about that. And fundamentally, it may be very difficult to say that uh, right at the beginning. But still, that raises the question, why would you assume that it is only at the beginning that you ask for consent? Why don't you have a repeated approach to interaction with the user as the system actually also develops and learns and draws the consequences? So at that moment in time that the consequences become relevant, you could ask in a number of situations, I'm not saying always, but number of situations you could ask for consent again and then it's an immediate impact which may be simpler to understand than a whole long text about anything that potentially could happen. There's a simple answer to that though. You talk to any of my clients and they will want to make sure that they get all the consent yeah, right yeah. up front because sure. you know they, they don't want the <laughs> you know the, the obligations of having to go back to the consumer or to the customers and so you know usually when we draft these policy provisions for them or these agreements they tell us right up front you know can you just can we make it as you know, inclusive as possible? Um, and so that, that is what we do, because if there is nothing to, to prevent us from doing that, then you know, why, why not? And I think that's a difficulty. I, I, I mean, I think what you're suggesting is something, is thinking of it more as a matter of user interaction design or user experience design, right? Rather than perhaps asking for everything up front or trying to get an extremely broad consent or ask for extremely broad consent up front that, um, that you might ask for some consent initially, more later. How and when you do that may be difficult depending on the nature of the product um, and whether there even is a touch point with the user that comes later. Uh, but certainly, uh, I think thinking of these notions of consent in terms of user experience design, user interaction design, uh, can be a fruitful way to get closer to, uh, uh, to, get closer to a strong notion of consent. Um, in a way that is less burdensome on the user. I just go back to that point as well. I think, I think a lot of consumers, you know, they they don't really they don't really need to know the algorithm or to understand it. What they want to know is, you know, what is a different way in which you're going to use my the purpose in which my data is going to be used. Not so much the algorithm, because I've heard that excuse before. You know, where some companies say, oh well, you know, there's no point us explaining the algorithms to the consumers or the customers because they're not going to understand that. Um, but that's that's not the concern they have. It's the change in use. Quick follow up for you. Uh, is it is it possible to have a discussion in the abstract about the notice and consent regime without looking at the market concentration in many uh, markets for digital products and services? Because if you're choosing between two or three mobile phone companies, or two or three search engines, or two or three face uh, social media platforms or mortgage lenders or hospitals, asking someone to opt out because they disagree with the consent provisions is inviting them to not participate in modern society. So it, it, there, I think, is a, a relationship between market structure 
and privacy policy, which in many cases is definitive, that you, you don't really have a, a realistic alternative other than the consent. True, true. Uh, it must be said that I, I thought it was interesting in what was going around in Twitter, because I, I don't know who uh, attached a, a statement there from the FCC having just issued some privacy guidelines for uh, internet access providers, which actually describe the situation when there is no choice. So, so they say you have to be additionally careful when there is actually not a real choice, which may be the case there. So I, I think there's a certain sensitivity uh, around giving the notion of fairness, which includes the notion of choice. So let me at this point invite all of you to uh, raise your hands. Uh, Tim, are we passing a microphone around in order to get everyone on, uh, on the recording? So I'll just start over here and work my way across the room. Could I identify your name and affiliation before you give your question, then your, our panelists will know who they're talking to. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Jim Garrett. I'm the Dean of the College of Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. And I, I want to come back to what uh, Andrew started with, with this idea of privacy versus personalization, you know, in, in conflict. It would seem that the last part of this discussion raises the question, why don't we apply personalization to privacy? So, you know, the only choice being I have to take one blank consent form. It's either that or nothing. Whereas if there were some way for me to fill out a privacy profile so that it described what I wanted to share, what I did want to share, how I wanted to share my data, could that not then be you know, applied against whatever the company uh, is saying is their, their you know, privacy policy? And so I don't have to read every one of them. I simply spend the time saying what I'm about and let, you know, let, let the interaction happen. It's more like a personalization applied to privacy. And that seems to remind me of the, of the point you brought up about how competition in the private sector can potentially mitigate against abuses on um, privacy policies. Maybe this sure. is a, a question you can respond to. Sure. Um, and there are, a couple of, there are a couple of avenues that I think come to mind here. One is this idea that a user might uh, check some boxes or slide some sliders in a user interface and give some idea about their preferences with respect to privacy. And then there would be either um, uh, an enforcement of that on the user's behalf or some kind of automated negotiation between the user's technology, let's say in their browser or app, and, um, some, and a company's technology so that um, things would only happen within the bounds that the user had said were acceptable. And there have been various attempts to build those sorts of technologies. Um, none of them have taken hold for reasons that I think are uh, largely contingent. Um, it could easily have turned out that um, such a thing had become, became popular, but, um, but for reasons too complicated to go into here, I think that has mostly not happened. The other approach is one that is, uh, takes more of a machine learning kind of approach, where uh, you're, you're trying to ask the user a relatively limited number of questions about specific questions about what they want. And then you have a technology that on the user's behalf tries to infer how, what decision they would make in other cases. Um, and I think that idea of a sort of personal privacy assistant that operates on the user's behalf um, is one of the uh, technological vehicles that um, that could develop. Um, and again, you have questions, sort of contingent questions of technological development that may make that more likely, may make it more, um, may make it easier or more likely to be deployable. Um, but certainly that I think is one direction in which users may be able to put technology to work on their behalf to manage this stuff. Because the complexity of these choices, um, uh, if the user has to make every single detailed choice is just too much. Just add one comment, please. So I, I think uh, it's very uh, it's a very interesting idea, and the question is, will it hold against all of the four cases of Andrew? And I, it may not hold against the third case, which is I think you can use the personal data, but it's bad for society. So personalization of privacy would it? Well, I think it needs to it merits to be discussed, but would it actually eliminate the risk of uh, things being bad for society? Maybe we we'll take another question. Yes, right in the back. Microphone is coming. Uh, yes, it's uh, Jose Colon from the State Department. Uh, 
I believe you only you are focusing on part of the issue of privacy because there are other means of data collections that doesn't involve people clicking on the internet. When you go to a store, for example, Target, there are many cameras following you. You pay with a credit card. There's a lot of information using machine learning that they are gathering on these days. Uh, they are using those for many purposes. Uh, we had the case of Samsung with the smart TVs and listening to conversation from people. So how would you address those? Uh, that's a bigger issue, probably as big as you clicking the I said on the internet. Any responses? I think this gets to the issue of if, if you have a model based on notice and consent, how can you talk about consent in a case where collection of data happens in the environment, um, such as with cameras or with microphones that are out in the world? And the cases that are in a public place are, I think, some of the most difficult here. Um, if there's a product in your home which has a microphone or camera and that's turned on without your consent, that seems to be not a difficult case from a policy standpoint. Um, but in a public place where there is not an interaction with the user where consent could naturally be sought, I think this becomes a pretty difficult issue. And I don't think we have all the answers to those by any means. And for us, it's also a real part of the debate because actually two parts are those fundamental rights, the, the confidentiality of uh, communications and your private life, and the data protection part. And this, what you mentioned, uh, touches upon both as aspects. And so you may actually, that's also considered as a very important right, that your confidentiality, where you're going around, you're, you are not to be tracked uh, even if that doesn't necessarily in, and immediately involve personal data, still a right to be protected. So it's, it's really part of the debate in Europe. Yes, right in the back. Hi, my name is Andrew Hanna. I'm with Politico. Some of you have talked about shifting responsibility back to corporations in terms of um, privacy agreements, and others have talked about softer forms of governance. I was just wondering, and in terms of shaping uh, what data can be used. I was wondering if you could be a little more concrete and talk about tangible initiatives that could be undertaken on a policy level to allow for this to happen. Let me start. Um, well, I think this already is happening. Um, if you look at the dynamics that drive the privacy policies of some of the large companies and the ways in which companies use data, uh, there is a competitive um, uh, dynamic that, that operates um, in which uh, companies would, on the one hand, would like to be able to use data um, to, um, uh, to optimize their business goals, but on the other hand, would like to be able to promise to consumers that the use of data is limited to things that consumers would find acceptable. And of course, those promises once made have legal force. And so I think you see this operating um, already. Um, it's inherent in a model of um, notice and consent that um, consumers will may either withhold notice or may take their business somewhere else if they don't like what's being done in a particular setting. Um, and so uh, I, I think this is a dynamic that operates already um, and it is something that is driven both by the enforcement of law, for example, by the FTC um, with respect to companies keeping their privacy promises to consumers and it's also driven by some of the public dialogue and it's driven by, um, as well by the uh, public debate and by some of the press coverage about privacy practices. All of those things, I think, push companies to try to make stronger promises to consumers, which they then have to keep. Question, I think it was one right in the middle. Yes, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Carrie Ann from the Organization of American States. Um, the question is kind of tied to the gentleman in the back that asked about other forms of data collection. Um, most of you would recall like when Ty came online in March earlier this year and what happened to her in terms of how she actually collected data and the result. In terms of privacy, there's so much open data that's available in blogs that is private, you, that has some amount of personal data Facebook, you have algorithms you can build that can just scrape data from all those sources that are open. How is that tied back to consumer protection if there's actually no obligation by the person who may be developing these new AIs that we don't know about 
that's actually collecting it. How does privacy really come in if we're actually pushing our data out there that's actually open to anyone to use? I'm just wanting your thoughts on that. Great question. Yeah, strictly speaking, if you are able to start re-identifying, it becomes personal data and you still fall under, under data protection law. So uh, you have to look at uh, uh, how far you push the boundary in uh, using also open data to re-identify uh, and, and, and the case that you mentioned is real. It's uh, real. So that, that's where people have to take a responsibility or at least in the European situation, they, they would be uh, liable against, uh, they would infringe the law. Hi, my name is Al Gombas. I work for the State Department. Um, I'm curious uh, if we were to create a uh, scenario where we can negotiate the privacy restrictions, um, what might happen then I think might be that uh, companies will incentivize consumers to give more data, they'll give discounts or something in the event that uh, if they want to get more data from the individual or consent. And I'm wondering uh, how that might play out, if you think that's a good idea, a bad idea, whether we should have a blanket uh, law saying, no, you can't do that, you have to offer the same discounts to everybody regardless of what the, uh, what the amount of uh, privacy they, they require of the company or not, um, and how consumers may be taken advantage of. For example, poor uh, consumers may be in a position where they feel they have to give up more data just because they can't afford the service w without it. I think there was a study actually that showed that consumers are, you know, are, they, they, they prefer this, um, you know, giving some information and then having the ability to, to consent, you know, if, if additional information or different uses are going to be made of the data. Um, and I think the, the other point that this um, study showed, I, I can't remember the name actually, uh, was that consumers generally are, are willing to, to give more information if they get something in return. Um, and I think that's, again, we go back to the notion of fairness, I think, because one of the, one of the, you know, the problematic areas that we have is that, you know, either the consumer or the customer doesn't know how the data is being used or, or is being used in a different way and, you know, no notification has been given. Um, and I think the third thing is that the companies are the ones who benefit. They've been able to monetize, you know, the data or use it for, for marketing reasons, but the consumer hasn't actually benefited additionally from from you know that that different use or that additional information, so I, I think at the end of the day, I mean, it's we go back to notice and consent, you know, uh, in in and, and not necessarily you know right at the start of a relationship, but you know perhaps as as that relationship progresses. Perhaps if I can add something to that, because I, for me there are two dimensions in it. One is uh, indeed, do you provide fairness uh, in the perception of the user? while the data is being used, and uh, a number of people are saying that's not the case, because you get disproportionately a lot of value out of it, and you don't give part of that value back to me. That's one part of the debate. The other part of the debate is, uh, does the consumer actually have really a fair choice right in the beginning? So if there is actually a de facto oligo uh, oligopolistic or monopolistic situation, and look back again at the statement that the FCC did uh, last week about uh, access to the internet, you cannot be forced is essentially, I think, what they are saying. You cannot be forced to give up your browser data, etc., your browser preference data. Uh, otherwise, you don't have access to my service. And there's not so much choice in that service, in that internet access service. So somewhere there's also that aspect of, um, is there a reasonable balance the moment that uh, there's an essential service being provided versus the use of these personal data? You cannot start excluding people from having access to an essential service. It is not that different from, you know, regulations where you, you need the government to step in to, to start the ball rolling where, you know, if, if none of the internet servers or the internet providers are, are actually, um, you know, I mean, I think it's going to be quite difficult in some sectors where to, to wait for the, the companies, you know, to take the initiative to, to regulate themselves. I think this is one of those issues where you, you have to have the government step in and, and just to start the ball rolling. Uh, yes, ma'am, right here in the front. Uh, my name is Erica Basu. I'm a PhD student at uh, American University. Uh, my question is um, about um, the notion of democracy in all of this. And while we are speaking uh, quite 
to a room full of people who have a fairly good idea of some of the terms that we're using, like notice and consent and terms of service and data privacy and AI. I'm just wondering uh, what this all means in terms of access to even this information about what these terms are. And is it just a conversation between policymakers and corporations who have access to these definitions? Or is it really a conversation that you're having with the users who get affected by it? Great question about literacy. I mean, I think you see, in practice, you see a lot of discussion, a lot of chatter among policy experts. Um, and you see more occasional flare-ups of direct public interest in some of these issues and in some of the practices. Um, and as is often the case in governance, um, the elites are sweating the details every day and uh, there is a corrective of the public um, noticing something that seems quite wrong to them and speaking up loudly. Um, and I think that is how these things often do operate. Um, the, um, Certainly, um, uh, and we do certainly see those, um, uh, those flare-ups of direct public interest uh, from time to time. One of the, uh, uh, the, the points in the debate in Europe is also whether uh, machine learning AI uh, should also be made more widely available on, in a kind of an open AI type of uh, environment, which actually could be quite an interesting point for international cooperation. So that's kind of democratizing the tools themselves. Yes, sir. Front. Thank you. Uh, Daniel Reisner from Israel. Um, my question is, Ben, you mentioned the, a phrase, the, you mentioned old frameworks when we were discussing this issue. And one of my questions relates to one of the oldest frameworks we're using, which is the concept of a state. In the, in, in the framework of this discussion. Because we all realize that we've globalized every element of this discussion. I mean, the data, in spite of localization efforts, is globalized. Uh, companies hold data. The same piece of information is usually split between two, three different locations on the same server. And some of my clients split them up over different continents so that you don't actually get the same piece of data in any one location anyway. And the company holding the data is actually multi-structured and it sits on 25 different locations as well. And so on the one hand, the data is globalized. The players are globalized. And that raises the question, what is the role of the states? And I'll give you an example which I faced relatively recently in Israel. The Israeli government decided, called me up one day and said that they wanted, not the whole government, but parts of it. and 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 they said to me that they had decided to regulate an international cloud services provider. And I asked them, why do you think you should regulate them? Because they're not an Israeli company. They're not uh, active in Israel per se, although you can buy their products online, etc." And I said, oh, it's very simple because they offer the services to an Israeli government entity. And I said, but the cloud sits somewhere in Europe, I think. And the company is an American company, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, yes, but the service is being offered in Israel, so it's our job to regulate. And I pushed back and I said, well, if you want to regulate it for that purpose, then 211 other countries in the world could legitimately make the same argument because it's a global service, right? And I said, you really think it makes sense? What you think? And they said, we never thought of that. We'll take it under advisement, and I haven't heard from them since. <laughs> now, the issue I want to raise is, what do you think we should be doing? I mean, governments are still our main tools of policy, but when we all recognize that Facebook has more to say about the privacy of its constituent element than any government in the world, with apologies to all governments represented, are we still having the discussion in the right forum, or should we be thinking of a different mechanism where we actually have a discussion, engagement with the right players in the right forum? A, a very simple question. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see something similar happening in the debate around cybersecurity. Uh, which is uh, considered uh, by some very much a national issue, but global companies are saying, I want to buy the best cybersecurity in the world. I don't care really where it comes from, but I need to have the best because I'm a global company. 
is that necessarily contradictory? Uh, I don't think in all cases. Does it mean that you need to go for some form of global governance? Well, at least a form of international governance, yes, because you need to have an idea of what is the quality of cybersecurity. So I think that uh, demand supply side cooperation, if I simplify that grossly, um, could be quite fruitful in cases like this. So what are global companies actually asking when they talk about data protection and uh, or privacy and, uh, and uh, machine learning? And uh, how is that looked at from, let's say, both the, the perhaps more nationally determined cultural values around that? And I think that's also the plea in the community to make sure that ethics, uh, the, the, the cultural value discussion is, is really part of the debate around uh, AI and machine learning. So not only for academics, but also for the institutions that are involved in that. I don't think you can uh, get um, very far if you do this only nationally. No. Quick follow-up question. I think his question is really an important one. Do you think there are any global institutions that could channel national interests effectively at, at least a, a mini-lateral level? Meaning the largest number of states that are willing to meaningfully participate in a single standard. Companies. I guess it's not really organized or named as such, but uh, I pointed earlier to certain sectors in which you can start talking about the governance of data. And so you can build upon some of the existing governance that is there and make that more AI and machine learning aware, use that. We do not necessarily need to invent something new, but perhaps we do need to talk about uh, additional, well, institutionalized, let me put that in a, in between inverted commas, institutionalized forms of governance that can tackle this. So some people, there's an interesting proposal on the table of Nesta, a think tank and financing organization in the UK, that talks about uh, creating a machine uh, intelligence commission uh, that would work more on the basis of the notions around common law, so you let it evolve as you Get uh, the practice as you get exposed to the practice, and that would really bring experience together. Other comments on this point? We have about five minutes left. I'm going to try to take uh, a few more questions. Yes, sir. Carl Landwehr from the George Washington University uh, Cybersecurity Privacy and Research Institute. Um, uh, relying on lawsuits uh, largely to control corporate behavior in regard to privacy. And so I'm wondering, uh, in that case, people have to be able to identify harms. And I'm concerned about ability in the context of AI and machine learning to control I think we have that ability. That's, that's a tough question, and it gets to some deep technical issues, as you know. Um, the question of um, why um, an AI system did a particular thing, and what that system might have done had conditions been a, a bit different, uh, can be difficult to answer. Uh, but depending on what kind of decision it is that the system made or assisted in, there are um, different legal regimes that may operate, at least in the U.S., and uh, different burdens um, may, uh, different legal burdens may apply to the uh, the company that is uh, or institution that is making that decision with the help of AI. So um, I think it's more of a detailed question as to what kind of showing what kind of governance is needed. But I also think that um, uh, to the extent that um, people are naturally skeptical of whether complex AI-based decisions are being made in a way that is fair and justifiable. Um, I think that um, uh, to use these technologies in a way that is really sustainable um, in the longer run, I think will require greater effort at being able to explain why a particular decision was made or to be able to produce um, uh, evidence to justify the the fairness or efficacy of the decision that's being made. Um, it's not a simple issue, but I do think that um, it's not that um, in the public in protecting themselves and government in protecting the public against the sorts of harms you talked about are not without uh, either legal or technical um, capabilities. Let me ask a question that sort of sums up several that I've heard so far, which is given the inherent weaknesses of notice and consent, but recognizing it's the tool that we have. 
and recognizing the challenges of, of harm and, and identifying harm in adjudications, is there a combination of tools that might be used that are rooted in transparency? What does this algorithm do, or what is it intended to do? Therefore, we can get a better sense of whether it is producing a harm or may produce a harm. And that harm should be, or some, some approximation of that risk should be disclosed in the notice regime. What is the combination of tools that might best produce a, a, a framework for handling these technologies as we, as we move forward? You want to jump in on that? Yeah, yeah I think uh, that's a very good question, and Ed's uh, comment is just right. But there is something very interesting about when you're an AI engineer building one of these systems. It's sometimes very hard to diagnose why your system did something, but you always have to write down something called an objective function. When, for instance, if I decided tomorrow to release a program to help people navigate the streets of Washington in traffic efficiently by tracking everyone, all, all the cabs and all the other vehicles, if I write down my objective is for each user to get them to their location, their destination, as quickly as possible, then even if I'm doing some fancy algorithms which I don't quite understand to accomplish that, I can show that to a lawyer or a policymaker. This is why my algorithm is pooling data from many people. On the other hand, if I have supplemented a little bit because I'm getting paid by a coffee company to send people routing them past their coffee shops, then again, that will be sitting there in the code. So when you think about an AI or machine learning algorithm being written, Someone says, well, they're so complicated, we can't explain them. That's not a legitimate answer. Because when you write an AI algorithm, you always have to write the objective function. What is the thing that the AI system is trying to do? And so if you want uh, uh, companies to actually, or governments, to be clear about what their AIs are doing, it is legitimate to say, show me the objective function. Well, maybe we will. Uh leave it there with Andrew's optimistic uh, <laughs> vision about, about a possible way forward. Really appreciate that. Uh, please join me in thanking all of our great panelists for our discussion today. <laughs>